Welcome to the Booktopia podcast. I'm Ben Hunter, Booktopia's Fiction Category Manager, and this is a podcast about books and the brilliant people who read them and write them. I'm recording today over Zoom from my home on unceded Gadigal country, and my guest today is Hannah Kent. Uh, she's the multi-award winning author of uh, Burial Rights and Good People, which have been published globally in several different languages to very high acclaim. She's also a co-founder of the literary magazine, Kill Your Darlings. Uh, staff at Booktopia, including me, made uh, The Good People, our book of the year in 2016. And now, all these years later, we have a remarkable new novel to enjoy. It's called Devotion. Hannah Kent, thanks for being on the podcast. Thank you for having me. It's a joy to be here. Could you kick us off by giving just a, a few words to describe this highly anticipated new book? Sure. Well, Devotion begins with Hannah, who is the narrator of Devotion. When the book begins, she's uh, quite young. She's on the cusp of adolescence and lives in Prussia in a very tight-knit Lutheran community who are currently being persecuted uh, because they refuse to adapt to the Union Church and insist on practising their Lutheranism in the way that they have for many, many years. Um, Hannah is a daughter of an elder and she is someone who is something of an outsider in the community. She's someone who much prefers to spend time outside. She loves nature. She has a deep and abiding connection to nature. She hears it sing to her. She has this sort of very interesting synesthesia when it comes to being out in the weather and being out in a landscape. And um, when the book opens, she's just at that point in her life where her mother and father's tolerance of these wild freedoms of childhood is coming to an end. They are trying to prepare her for the role that her community and society have set aside for her, which is very limited. She's basically needs to prepare for marriage and for a life of domesticity. And Hannah is finding herself resentful of that, but also aware increasingly of the fact that she is unaccepted by her peers, by the other girls of the village. And so she's really quite lonely when the book opens. And then soon enough, she meets Taya. Taya is the daughter of newcomers to the village, similarly persecuted Lutherans, who are still yet a little different from Hannah's own family. Uh, Taya's mother, Anna Maria, is a midwife and suspected of the fellow villagers of being a bit of a which um, of having sort of of having dabbled in superstitious sort of practices uh, but Taya is on one hand incredibly different from Hannah in that she's been raised in this very affectionate household but similarly to her is something of an outsider herself and the two girls form a very fast and deep friendship which over the course of the book develops into something much deeper and long-lasting. It's That's probably gorgeous. a bit of an intro. But more things then happen, including emigration to uh, South Australia as the families, as yes. the community seek freedom. But really, the book is at its heart about this relationship between between the two girls. Yeah, it's a love story. That's what I keep describing it to people as first and foremost. Uh, reading this book has been a highlight of my year and it's been a dark and crazy year. It's, it's, it's been a highlight of my entire reading life, I'd say. Um, oh my goodness, thank you, Ben. Can I, <laughs> I'm so delighted to hear that. <laughs> uh, can, I, can I ask about your reading life, Hannah? Um, what were the stories that you loved as a child? Uh, what, what were the novels that made you want to be a novelist and, and, and what do you look for in a good book today? Well, that's a big question. You know, I've been a reader for far longer than I've been a writer and I'll be a reader into, you know, until my dying day. I'm not sure if I'll be a writer until my dying day, but books have always been such a huge part of, of my life and my identity because they are one of the things that have brought me such pleasure and so many other gifts um, since a very early age. I don't remember not being able to read. I think I was an early reader, um, but my parents, although they were great storytellers and my dad particularly would tell me, make up stories for me every single night, they weren't necessarily big book readers. And so when I fell into book reading, it was really through um, serendipity 
I was uh, looked after by a woman after school who <laughs> sometimes refused to let me come into her house when it was raining. She wasn't a particularly lovely woman. Um, so we'd all, all these kids would play in the backyard and sometimes when it was raining, we'd go into her shed. And um, in this shed one day, I found a giant stack of Enid Blyton books and you know I started reading them and then I asked if I could borrow this book from her and she's like oh take them I was going to drop them off at the op shop so my first books really that I read over and over again and kind of fell headlong into were Enid Blyton collections of stories and you know then I went into the classic sort of boarding school dramas and obviously now as an adult I know that there's so much about Enid Blyton which can be deeply problematic and it hasn't always aged well but I mean that was that was certainly her books were something that really created that kind of rabid interest in reading and then again I sort of just read indiscriminately growing up I read everything which was really wonderful because it was up to me then to decide my own interests and tastes over the years so you know I read Babysitter's Club I read Degrassi High novels basically anything I could get my hands on um used to read the backs of cereal boxes and magazines go to the library just borrow books anything that I wanted. Um, and then when I was in high school and considered myself a reader and started to claim it as something that made me me, I started probably just being a bit of a pretentious kid in some ways, decided I'd read all the Russians and um, read Anna Karenina and completely fell in love with Tolstoy. And then I, around this time, I had been considering, you know, becoming one of these magicians, becoming a writer, um, because it seemed to me that just such a glorious thing to be able to spend your life doing. Um, but it probably wasn't until I was an exchange student, so probably when I was about 17, 18, and I was in Iceland and incredibly lonely that I found the small section of English books in the high school's library. And I read Virginia Woolf's um, To the Lighthouse. And I had this Ooh. incredible experience of reading that book in like a twilight winter in Iceland and having a very physical sensation when I was reading it, like it felt like an epiphany, um, you know, this goosebumps and just felt so powerfully altered by her words that I thought I need to, I really do need to try to see if I can create this same effect, see if I can write, see if I can, this is something worthy to aspire towards. And I was so changed by that book and many others that I read throughout that year. Uh, Thomas Hardy and Margaret Atwood, just basically the small collection of books that were available there in the library. And they became such formative books for me to lean on as I returned to Australia and started doing writing at university. Um, and since then, you know, I think I've become a little bit more indiscriminate than I was when I was a, you know, snobby 17 year old reading Tolstoy um, and thinking that, you know, maybe some genre fiction wasn't necessarily for me. Now I read everything um, because mm. it's all it's all magical and there's always something which you can glean from it as a reader. And I like to challenge myself as a reader as much as a writer. So yeah, these days, I don't know, but I think I do tend towards lyrical writers. Um, a writer I've really been loving in the last, you know, five years um, is Sebastian Barry. And I'd say that he's a big mm -hmm. influence. People like Max Porter, people who do interesting things with language always stand out to me. Oh, that's, those are some excellent recommendations. Um, look them up <laughs> if, if you're um, interested. Uh, they're, they're some excellent writers. Um, Barry Wrights was set in Iceland. The Good People was set in Southwest Ireland. And this novel begins in Prussia um, in this closed off old Lutheran community, eventually follows that community to the colonial frontier of South Australia. Um, so I've got to ask, what what drew you to write in a a much more local setting, and how did you approach our kind of biased history of colonisation and the displacement of traditional owners um, as as an author, as an author of historical fiction? That's a good question. I think um, it was my fear of writing about our colonial history and a fear of have, writing about it but because you're writing in a historical context having to necessarily adopt the prejudice and bias and racism and atrocities of that place of that time um, that made me not do it for many years and the, I, I was very reluctant to do so because I think so much of writing historical fiction you're kind of walking a tightrope sometimes between portraying that place, you know, that I say place because it is a place, you know, time is a different place, mm. different country. Um, 
portraying it accurately, but not necessarily celebrating it. And I didn't want to write anything that could be construed as a kind of fetishization of our colonial history. Um, I wanted to write about it, but I didn't see how I could do that because I didn't feel that I could ever write from the perspective of an Aboriginal character. That's not my place. I feel very firmly that that's not my story to tell or my space to take up. Um, it's not my culture. But I also didn't really want to write from the perspective of a white invader, you know. Um, yeah. That to me would be abhorrent. <laughs> um, and so I, uh, I, it was something that I wrestled with for a long time. And then I was always interested in the German settlements and I see settlement in inverted commas um, in the German emigrants who arrived here after the British invasion um, because I'm related to them on my father's side. And I also grew up in the Adelaide Hills and there's quite a famous uh, village, which is now pretty well famous because it's a tourist town now, a tourist German town called Handorf, uh, which was one of the uh, which was originally set up on a place called Bocatilla on Paramount country here in the Adelaide Hills and has still maintained some of its German culture. I also don't live very far away from the very world famous Barossa region and, you know, mm. so much of that place and so much of South Australia really is still carries these memories of the, of that German culture, German language, things like that. And so I was always interested in doing it, um, but I wasn't sure how I was going to be able to essentially convey my, my personal, um, just distaste is too light a word my personal abhorrence and disgust of colonization in the 19th century in, in australia and also sort of render a story that i would be happy to sit with and so really that's what's led to i guess the the move away from an adherence to archival resources in this book with my first two books yeah. i was very much anchored myself to facts as they were with this book i thought that both the challenge of writing about Australia's colonial past and also, I guess, the personal desire to challenge myself and to do something a little bit different creatively led me to, yeah, kind of really step into an imaginative realm and, realm and try to really mix things up a little bit. And I'm not going to say how that appears in the novels um, because it's a bit of a spoiler. But, yeah, it's I've certainly done some things differently in this book and I think that's the reason I've done that. A big part of it is trying to negotiate um, my my disinclination to write about Australia's past, to trying to find a way that I can write about it and, yeah, convey the horror and the atrocity and the sadness of it all while still not necessarily, you know, breaking character. Yeah. And and you... Even, even with that um, differing approach from a much more uh, historical fact-based um writing practice it's it um it still captures so much of the importance and the the brilliance of the landscape and the people that you encounter um through throughout the the journey this novel goes on uh i want to talk about that that joy you you kind of already answered a question about um you know, an evolution of your writing style. But I've got to ask about the, the joy and the creativity and the imagination that, that shines in this book. Um, so this main character, Hana, is the most remarkable character. You can meet her as this gifted child on the cusp of young adulthood. Um, and she's queer and she doesn't have a, a language or a freedom to express or even understand what that is. Um, and, and, and like, you know, many of the women from your earlier writing, she has this unfathomable connectedness to the natural world. Uh, you describe this book in the author note as, as a kind of gift to a younger closet itself. So could you talk about the, the, the joy of creating the character and of writing a love story? Mm. I think with, uh, I mentioned earlier that my, my previous novels, I felt that I needed to apply a particular kind of rigour to researching these times and, and the lives that these books were based on. And part of that was me sort of doing my ethical due diligence. I didn't want to make stuff up because essentially those stories were, you know, stories of, of um, crime and grief and all this rather uh, traumatic stuff. And I felt to just make that up as kind of 
exploitative in a little way. I thought that if I did my research, I wasn't necessarily just turning someone else's tragedy into entertainment. Um, with this book, yeah, I did feel a little differently. I wanted to, I wanted to step back into the light. Um, initially, I just knew that I didn't want to, I wanted to write about a different landscape. Um, and I, at that stage, I was thinking about Australia, South Australia, mainly because I knew it would be difficult um, because I'm so familiar with the landscape and I didn't, I was really relying on my status as, as an outsider with those other countries to kind of look at it with new eyes. So I didn't know if I'd be able to do the Australian landscape justice. Um, but I also, I was also interested, I guess, in, um, in writing about something that wasn't so grim, I, you know, for myself, it's like a really six years looking at murders and, you know, jailed, executed women, things like that. It's really quite dark territory. And I wanted to step away and do something that initially I thought would be about community. I thought it would be about female friendship. I really wanted to show the power of female friendship. And then around 2017, when we had the plebiscite, um, my girlfriend proposed to me and I read this amazing book, uh, The Ghost Wife, a memoir by Michelle Dichinowski, which made me think, uh, you know, I've always been drawn to silences and absences as a writer. You know, what greater absence in history than stories of queer love? Um, they're so silent. They're so absent. And I remember growing up, you know, I was super closeted. I didn't, I wasn't one of those people who were, knew that they were queer, you know, from an early age. I was very confused for a very long time and probably repressed a lot of that sort of stuff in my own life. And one of the reasons it was easy to repress was because I didn't have these representations and I didn't feel like those that were available to me were relevant to me. Um, so, yeah, around that time I decided, no, I just want to write this queer love story. I want to celebrate it. And I want to write it in such a way that it's not, um, it's historical, but it doesn't necessarily partake of the historical shame or punishment, which is evident in so many other representations. I want to write this queer love story, which is uplifting and beautiful and, you know, eternal in so many ways. I wanted to make it grand and epic in the, in the bigger sense. And so that's, you know, where the book really started to find its pulse, um, its heartbeat. And I kept circling back to this character of, of Hannah. I wanted to show someone who, I wonder, I guess I wanted to explore initially someone who is queer and not really aware of it themselves, but who gains that awareness over the course of the novel. And like I said earlier, never really sort of feels ashamed about it, but instead sees it as something which gives their life, you know, beauty and, and meaning. And so that's where that came from. And I guess so much of other, because, you know, I'm queer myself, so much of Hannah's character became, was, I guess, informed by my own experiences. I was also writing this book under, you know, I was still writing it when the pandemic hit. I couldn't really go anywhere. So I found myself looking a little bit more inward than I have previously. And there's a lot about Hannah, her feelings of isolation and her love of nature and her kind of simultaneous desire to be alone but also be accepted by other people, a lot of that was born, like, came from my own adolescence and my own young adulthood. Um, so she's a character which is very special to me, um, both because I see some commonalities there. Of course, she isn't me entirely. She's absolutely her own character. But um, it was a real pleasure, actually, to explore some of my own experiences through literature. It's not something I've done previously. It's it's certainly very special to read. Um, I want to ask a, a, a question about language. Um, the, the impression the reader gets from the beautiful white jacket on this book um, and the title, Devotion, um, is, is one of, of Christianity and, and, and Christian love, right? Um, and, and many of the epigrams uh, at the front of the book come from scripture. And in this community, um, you know, the, the Bible is meant to be the only book, it's meant to be the only book uh, that, that uh, people read. And this Orthodox community, it's, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it informs the language and also just the thought um, and feelings and actions of everyone. Um, what's your relationship with the Bible, if not spiritually, then just textually as an author? Well, probably I'll answer the last part first. I am. Um... You know, there's exquisite writing in the Bible. 
um, there's, you know, I love the Song of Solomon. I love Psalms. I love Proverbs. I think, you know, you can look at the Bible as a text and see a lot of just how beautiful it is. Um, you know, just the, the, its use of language, the images that are conjured. Um, and I've paraphrased a lot of those in this book. Um, but, you know, there's a lot to just enjoy on a sort of an aesthetic level, I guess, from the Bible in terms of its deeper significance to so many. Um, I, I went to church when I was an adolescent. Um, I didn't come from a religious family. This was something that I initiated of my own accord. And I think it came from a, from a deep searching and a deep interest in spirituality. Um, and there was a lot that I experienced during my time of attending church and being part of a religious community that I really value and treasure. Um, inevitably, there was some sort of political stuff and a sort of a change of leadership at my church that meant I left it. Um, you know, I think also it's worth mentioning that there's, there was a time when I was wrestling with my sexuality and I didn't feel that I would be accepted within my church. I now know that many of the people who still attend or who have, you know, the, my peers who attended, you know, have hold very different views. So I'm very quick not to assume that every Christian, um, you know, necessarily uh, believes in, you know, gay conversion therapy and stuff like that. Um, but, yeah, there was a lot that, like I said, there was a lot that I really valued in that time. Um, there were a lot of lessons about love that I learnt. And I think those things, irrespective of whether or not you believe that the Bible is the word of God, there's a lot of food for thought in the Bible. And I think that's why religion inevitably comes up in my work a lot. That and also the fact that religion was so huge in people's life in the past. I don't think you can write a book of historical fiction and avoid religion, um, not only in the sense of faith or belief systems, but also just in the way it governed people's lives. You know, it had an, an, a, the church and it had an administrative role um, for lots of communities. Um, but, yeah, I think it's, yeah, there's obviously lots of stuff that I just work out privately but I would still consider myself a deeply spiritual person um, and someone who is interested in spiritual questions. I don't think I have any answers. Um, and maybe that's what separates me from other people who, who practice religion. Um, but the doubt that I have to me is no less spiritual. Um, I think doubt is an important part of my faith because it makes me ask questions and it keeps me seeking um, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but that's probably why it's so front. It certainly does. It, it does. And it does and more, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, uh, reading, reading passages of this book and um, I'm, I'm, I'm unsurprised to, to hear you say you, you, you've paraphrased from the um, uh, Psalms and such. There's a spiritual ecstasy to the way Hannah, um, moves through nature in particular. That's, that's, that's one of the really particular um, sheer joys in reading this novel. Um, and, it, it just, and it makes the tragedy um, that you'll encounter um, just as just even more palpable. Um, there's, there's something really powerful going on in this book. <laughs> it's really <laughs> special. Uh, you've mentioned that it is um, a departure from the earlier novels, um, but it is still historical fiction and it is still just so 100% Hannah Kent. Um, if you're a fan <laughs> of the older books, I, I definitely would never discourage you from going out and getting this one. Um, but I've, I've got to, I guess, wrap it up by asking what direction do you perceive your writing going in in future? I'm not sure to tell you the truth. And I think that's part of what's exciting about this. Um, one of the reasons why I wrote this book is because I didn't want to paint myself into a corner and do the same thing over and over again. You know, so much of writing this book and writing about nature and sort of trying something a little bit new um, was about returning to a place of play with writing, you know, which is why I started doing it. It's just for the joy of it. And so I wanted to write joyfully. I wanted to write in a way that gave me joy. Um, and I found the whole process, you know, intense and sometimes really challenging, but really enjoyable, um, particularly in retrospect when you're not in the thick of it. Um, so in terms of going forward, I 
you know, I want to keep doing that. I think, you know, to sort of sustain a writing career, um, I want to be able to always find it intensely enjoyable. And so that for me means I think I'm going to have to continue challenging myself and trying new things. But, yeah, um, probably just not knowing, the not knowingness of writing. <laughs> I'm not someone who plans ahead very much. The not knowingness is kind of the exciting part too. Um, so I'm not sure. I think I'll probably the next project, I've got some ideas. I always have ideas. So I think I'm just going to sort of have a little tinker and see see what takes off and, yeah, and as usual, have no idea what I'm doing, but hopefully be able to pull it together in the end. But certainly, you know, I still have an abiding interest in historical times, um, mainly because I think they can speak so eloquently to the present. But I'm also really interested in maybe pushing, pushing ideas of genre, pushing ideas of what language is capable of and what it can serve. Um, so, yeah, I probably not, I'm not going to say too much more of that because everything I'm working on is still so unformed and malleable and exciting. So, yeah, watch this space. <laughs> well, wherever you go, we will follow. Hannah Kent, thank you for being on the Booktopia podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Ben. Devotion is published by Pam McMillan, and you can get a copy of it right now from booktopia.com.au. Thank you for listening to the Booktopia podcast channel. Don't forget, you can subscribe to us on SoundCloud and iTunes for free and get access to hundreds of author discussions, book analysis pieces, and more. Or, if your eyes need a workout, head to Booktopia TV on YouTube. Don't forget, for all books featured in this podcast, and for access to a whole bunch of other fun content on our blog, head to Booktopia, Australia's local bookstore, at booktopia.com.au.